Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, as you can see, I'm not Jillian. Uh, she actually had a conflict, so she will be here later. Uh, my name is Beatrice Magistro, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Schwartz Riesman Institute for Technology and Society here at the University of Toronto. Today, I'm pleased to introduce to you Professor Boris Babic, who just joined the University of Toronto and is one of our newest faculty affiliates here at the Schwartz Riesman Institute. Boris will be giving a talk today about the case against explainable artificial in intelligence and machine learning. Boris is an assistant professor with joint appointments in the Department of Philosophy and the Department of Statistical Sciences. And before joining the University of Toronto this July, he was an assistant professor of decision sciences at INSEAD. We're grateful for his presence today among us. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Boris. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Beatrice, and thank thank you all for being here. Um, so let me just share my screen before I start. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, um, my talk today will be the case against explainable, mostly medical machine learning. Um, I guess the I guess the title is intended to be a little bit provocative to sort of push back on the recent explo explosion of literature and explainable AI. Um, this is based on some joint work with uh, three of my colleagues, uh, Glenn, Glenn Cohen, Teo Sevgenyu, and Sarah Gerke. Uh, so there will be, I'll roughly talk in three parts. I mean, first, uh, First, just what, what, what the motivation is for the explainability paradigm. Why, why do explainable machine learning um, to begin with? Uh, then I will step back a little bit to actually talk about what this notion of explainability is. So the first part is just sort of motivational. We haven't really even said what explainability, explainability is so far, um, but just why, why might one wanna do this stuff? Uh, second part, step back a little bit and then explain a little bit more precisely what, um, what explainability algorithms are and how they generally work. Um, I will be focusing in particular on a couple paradigms. Not, it's, it's, I, I can't say this is an exhaustive argument against every conceivable approach to providing an explanation, but at least against the sort of um, Parad paradigmatic options in the literature. And then part three will be basically the, the, the argument against the fruitfulness of, uh, of trying to, or basically trying to explain um, opaque algorithms. Uh, the, two, the two paradigms that I'll focus on and I will kind of define them when we get there are linear approximations and counterfactual explanations. And I have a bit of an appendix of what can we do instead, but to be honest, the core of the presentation is the argument against explainable AI. Um, and unfortunately, um, I, I, I don't think I have a sort of competing paradigm to pitch here. So that's just so some, some thoughts of what, what can we do that could be helpful if we're not doing explainability, but that's more of an afterthought than the core of the argument. Okay, so the the main the main motivation that's given for doing explainable artificial intelligence and machine learning is basically the notion of understanding why uh, why a decision was made in a certain way rather than another, and this sort of need for 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 capturing the why behind the decision is the predominant rationale for. Uh, for uh, motivating all kinds of explainability algorithms. So we want to know why, if, if, if some kind of automated decision making makes a prediction or, or a decision, whatever the output is, we want to know why did it do that? Why not something else? Um, and the intuitive notion behind understanding why and the sort of from the perspective of why we care from, from a legal process perspective or from a perspective of the, the democratic accountability 
is wanting something like a causal explanation. Like if the glass hadn't been dropped, it wouldn't have broken. I mean, that's, that's the kind of why that's motivating the background picture for why we want explanations. We want a rationale for why a decision was made the way it was made. And that can be helpful for uh, basically if, if one wants redress, if we want, um, if we want to know uh, what could I have done differently so that it wasn't made that way? If, uh, you know, what could I have done differently so that I'm, not, that I'm not rejected for a certain loan or a certain application or, or a college decision, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, kind of uh, a related rationale to understanding the why behind the decision would be that explainable AI can help us sort of build trust. And all of my images here are just sort of clipped some. So one is from a uh, one is from a DARPA program on explainable artificial intelligence. So I just sort of clipped some ideas of um, this is sort of how these things are usually touted. Like this is why we wanna do explainable AI. Um, same thing when it comes to building trust. If we understand why um, a decision was made the way it did, then we're much more likely to trust it. Um, and we have some pretty pictures at the bottom here too of how um, if we get if we get explanations of black box predictions, they would be more trustworthy. Um, same thing here from one of the leading papers. The the main motivation for for what we'll look at later, which are linear approximations, is to build trust. Um, and finally, accountability, uh, which which is sort of related to legal process rationales. It, I mean, the thought here is that, hey, look, we've got this problem with black box algorithms. Um, if we could kind of take a peek inside, open up the black box, so to speak, it would be easier to figure out um, who's accountable for when things go wrong or when decisions are made in one way rather than another. So the alleged virtues are that we want to understand the why or the rationale behind classification. Uh, we want to build trust. Uh, we want to promote accountability. And all three of these are related to further downstream benefits, which I've mentioned a little bit throughout. Uh, this helps us clarify uh, liability, who's to blame and who's responsible when, uh, when mistakes are made. Um, it can help reduce uh, bias and discrimination and injustice across different groups when, when a decision is automated. And it can, um, it can increase engagement with the system uh, and so forth. So a lot of these sort of benefits come from the value of legal process constraints of satisfying certain democratic ideals, transparency ideals, um, and so forth. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of the part one was just like, why, why would anyone want to do this? Why, why are we doing um, explainable AI? And what's the worry with black box algorithms? So this is kind of why. These are the, these are the typically given rationales um, for why we would want to do this. Okay, so next I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit more carefully then about what what the explainability paradigm is and and what it's not and what the argument here will be targeted against so the first step to doing that is to define a little bit more carefully this notion of a, of a black box algorithm and then what i'll call a white box algorithm and a gray box algorithm um, so a machine learning model is a black box if the estimated function uh, call it F, relating inputs to predictions is not understandable at an ordinary human level. Now, um, if this sounds a little bit, if this sounds a little bit vague, uh, it, it is vague, but let's leave it at that for now. So this may be due to, for example, the function relying on an extremely large number of parameters, complex combinations of parameters, or nonlinear transformations of parameters. Um, kind of deep learning models and more generally neural net models with many layers are archetypal examples of a black model, black box model, and they're especially pervasive in medical applications. So the, 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 the definition is imperfect, but um, 
I'll generally focus on sort of canonical examples of that, that, that sort of that satisfy this definition of what a black box is. So, and most of them share a family resemblance with each other. Um, of course, at the margins, given the way that I've set this up, like one can always ask, well, even something as simple as a decision tree, uh, as a decision tree or a linear model, um, you know, what does it mean for it to be understandable at an ordinary or average level? What's average? Does one have to, does one have to have a familiarity, uh, uh, an understanding of linearity in order to understand a certain model? How much are we assuming? But um, I think for the most part, by focusing on sort of canonical examples, we can avoid the definitional disagreement. So the, the idea for now is just that uh, like, a, like a deep learning model or something where the features are highly engineered and transformed through linear combinations, it wouldn't provide any kind of information to the user that, 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 that they can work with at an individual level. And indeed, most medical devices uh, cleared for use by the FDA involve uh, black, black models, like sort of archetypal deep learning models. So then what would be what would be a white box model? Well, a machine learning model is a white box if the estimated function can be can be understood in a sort of ordinary or average or reasonable human level. What what I would want to um, include as canonical example of this is simple additive linear models uh, with a modest number of parameters. And within such a model, it's sort of easy to explain to someone or for someone to understand that we can think of the parameter coefficients as corresponding to the magnitude of a variable's contribution to the prediction. In a decision tree, we can sort of define a few number, uh, a, a small number of steps that are taken in order to get to the prediction. So everything that we sort of count as white boxes is kind of like a, the way a doctor might compute a typical risk score by looking at um, by looking at certain uh, certain features associated with a, the, the disease and almost using like a point scoring system additively in order to get to a prediction. This is the kind of thing that someone can work with and understand what they could have done differently in order to reduce their risk of diabetes, what they should do differently going forward and so forth. It gives them sort of usable, actionable information. Um, and in a sense, if, uh, I mean, the, 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 the definitions are just sort of an attempt to capture not so, it's not so much that the argument I'm going to give crucially depends on the definitions. It's just an attempt to capture the definitions that are already kind of presupposed in the literature because everyone doing explainable AI is doing linear modeling of nonlinear uh, algorithms. So it's, it's, it's sort of, um, my argument will be of that, uh, it will, will be of that kind of strategy. Uh, so it doesn't really depend on one or another definition of what a black box is and isn't. But I think this is a workable one for the sake of the project. Um, yeah, but, but it's not perfect. It doesn't exhaust the logical space and there is a large gray area. Um, how many parameters is too many? What if the average person understands a variable's contribution causally? What about simple transformations like uh, like for a logistic regression, there is a lot of gray area where we can ask, is that a white box? Is that a black box? Um, what does it take to understand um, these kinds of models? But for the most part, I think I can avoid that in the talk by focusing on canonical cases. Okay. So then with, with that kind of conceptual background in mind, here's what the explainability paradigm does more particularly. And I will define this by distinguishing it from what we've called in, in, this, in this project, the interpretability paradigm. So you can think about explainability, interpretability, both as attempts to do something that increases transparency of machine learning models, uh, but they do it in two different ways. So suppose we have a black box as defined previously, which uses some data uh, to estimate a function to estimate a function f, which will then make um, predictions uh, on on the basis of the inputs, which I've called here the the uh, black box y hats. So the interpretability the interpretability paradigm is very simple. Um, there's nothing sort of uh, mysterious about this. We just replace the black box with the white box. 
and we then feed the data uh, the same, uh, the, we, we feed it the same data, the XY pairs to estimate a different function, which we use to make predictions, which I've called now the, the white box uh, Y hats. And we never use the black box again. The, the black box is discarded. So interpretability just says that that's all. Just replace the black box algorithm with one that is that is understandable as I've defined it, or if you prefer to define it slightly different as you defined it. But basically replace the black box with something that you like that's interpretable. And the benefits of this are it's it's open and transparent and can be understood. Now here's the explainability paradigm. And, and it, it is this paradigm that, that our argument um, is targeted at. So interpretability paradigm, that's, that's fine. We're, we're, we, we take no issue with this. The explainability paradigm does the following. We identify a white box, which tracks as closely as possible the predictions of the black box. In other words, it's a function h, which we then use to predict the, the black box y hats. We then say that the white box explains the black box by producing to the user of the output, consumers, doctors, patients, whoever, both of these functions, both the F and the H. The black box continues to be used for predictions and the white box continues to be used for explaining those predictions. They work in tandem. So an example, um, basically suppose we have some, we have some nonlinear, um, classification algorithm, we can then find a linear model that is as close as possible to this black box model. And we can then in, in some subset of the data space, and we can then use that linear model as the basis of our explanation to the patient or the doctor or the user for why uh, the algorithm made the prediction that it did. So note a few things about this paradigm. The black box remains the basis for the prediction and the decision. The, this, the, the white box is the best an imperfect local approximation. So, I mean, it, it has to be an imperfect approximation because otherwise F and H would be the same function. So the, the linear approximation to a nonlinear classification boundary is gonna be is going to be similar only sort of in areas where <clears throat> they are roughly tangent to each other, but not, not, not everywhere. And the white box uh, with the white box's output is notice it is a post hoc, post hoc rationalization. It is something that's generated after the prediction has been made as sort of our quote unquote best guess of why the decision was made the way it did, where that guess is constructed by making a number of assumptions. For example, um, the, the linearity assumptions when we generate the, uh, the linear approximation. Um, okay. So one thing that one might wonder initially is given the way that I have defined this explainability paradigm and the interpretability paradigm, why would we ever adopt the explainability paradigm if we can just use an interpretable model? Um, and indeed, some people like, uh, like Cynthia Rudin, for example, have argued that, that that's exactly what we should do, that we should just use interpretable models and stop doing explainability, which in, gen which in general, um, like we, we agree with here. So um, this argument is in support of that point. Um, but basically, I mean, it's not a point that, that many people would easily adopt because the ordinary rationale is that in cases with very high dimensionality like image recognition or um, or genetic prediction, black box models, it's thought outperform simple white box ones. Um, for example, uh, an FDA approved uh, medical system called Rhythm Analytics is a deep neural network system trading on uh, ECGs to predict a bunch of uh, arrhythmias in cases like this, accuracy matters, matters a lot and simple linear models are, it's claimed, unlikely to perform as well. 
But in short, if one wants to continue doing any kind of deep learning, then we're using black, mo black box models. And so the, interpret the, the interpretability paradigm, which says just stop doing that, isn't really a persuasive one to most people because it pretty much rules out like most of um, kind of exciting machine learning applications that people are working on today. And not just exciting, but really like most of the ones that for instance, in the medical context have been approved by the FDA in the US are using some kind of deep learning. So it's not really persuasive to just say like, let's not do all of that. Um, so that's that. That's why people turn to explainability. Explainability basically says, okay, fine, you can keep using whatever algorithms you want, and then we do this after the fact approximation, which is going to explain how uh, how the algorithms are making the prediction that they're making. But this is the core of the problem and the core of our issue with explainability algorithms. It, 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 it's fine to say we want to use these models because they perform better or to show that they do indeed perform better. But it's the second step stage of kind of trying to have your cake and eat it too, so to speak, where you say, oh, but we can make it transparent by... Uh, providing a post hoc rationalization uh, by generating a linear model that's similar to the nonlinear algorithm in some subset of the space and then giving you that later. You end up with a kind of bait and switch. You were hoping that you would, uh, you would get to peek inside the black box in some magical way, but instead you're given a post hoc rationalization of how the decision might have been made, even though by hypothesis that's not the actual rationale uh, of, the, of how it was made. So that's, that's sort of, uh, that's going to be like the core argument, which I'll, which I'll unpack, which I will unpack more in this section. So um, basically, we call this notion of understanding that, that explain that the explainability paradigm generates, um, like ersatz understanding or pseudo understanding, uh, uh, misleading notion of understanding. So the typical notions of understanding in law and philosophy revolve around sort of grasping the internal workings of a system, capturing the why between a system's input and output, or ideally determining the causal relationships uh, within the system. And this kind of understanding, this sort of causal notion, which really um, gets to understanding the why behind the decision, if we could provide that, then that would certainly satisfy the kind of uh, legal process and democratic accountability ideals that I started with at the beginning, which motivate the explainability paradigm. But I hope it's clear now that this is not what we get from explainability algorithms, which approximate black box ones. Uh, in law, especially, we're particularly interested in understanding an agent's predicate intent for an act, because knowing why they did what they did often determines whether and to what extent they should be punished. But explainable machine learning models are unable to contribute to an understanding of the black box in any of these senses. The, the post hoc rationales of the predictions um, algor algorithmically generated by the white box are not necessarily, or by hypothesis are not, the actual reasons behind those predictions, nor are they causally related to them. So that's why we call it uh, sort of pseudo or starts understanding. Such, a, such algorithms often give us the false impression that we, we better understand the inner workings of the black box um, rather than providing a, a, a sort of genuine explanation of, of uh, or providing the real rationale for why a decision was made. So the structure of the argument here is, you know, between a false sense of understanding and no understanding, one would be better off with no understanding. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to sort of understand, you know, I mean, if the, if the system is being, this is sort of like something that's come up in previous presentations, right? If the, if the, if the, if the system is being developed for, let's say, um, to assist doctors in making their uh, diagnoses, right? Um, then insofar as one can train doctors to understand what, um, what neural network algorithms sort of what they do and their structure and the underlying mathematics or an intuitive understanding of them, like those are those are all great. I mean, kind of like education of what machine learning models are doing is 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 great. Our argument is not against that, but providing a post hoc rationale and presenting that misleadingly as an explanation of how of of why the black box prediction is what it is, 
that's where we see the sort of problem, or at least not so much, uh, yes, the problem and, you know, at best, there is no value to that. At, at worst, it's disvalued through a misleading explanation. So here's a kind of um, example, uh, an analogy to give. Um, what's wrong with this sort of er ersatz notion or understanding? Well, suppose, um, you know, uh, suppose to give a legal analogy, one morning a judge or parole officer issues a series of summary decisions denying parole to a group of defendants. Uh, the defendants object, requesting an explanation for their refusal of parole. In response, the judge's assistant looks at their files and notices a pattern. Uh, each defendant denied parole has two or more prior offenses while those granted parole do not. And this is provided as an explanation. Is this explanation adequate? In intuitively, no, because it's not the judge's reasoning, it's a post hoc rationalization of it. The assistant could have noticed all kinds of patterns in, in, in retrospect. Uh, they could have noticed that each of the defendants had been convicted of at least one violent crime or that all of the defendants granted parole volunteered in a prison book club or that they wore the same color of shirt, etc. So all of these could have been um, adequate explanations by reference to the sort of explainability paradigm. But such explanations do not bring us any closer to understanding the judge's approach to, to parole decisions. And one way to cash that out is that they're not particularly resilient. If, the, if we change the data just a little bit, the rationales could change quite a lot, as, as you can imagine in the sort of in the case where the pattern is that they all volunteered in a prison book club or wore the same color of shirt. Um, thus, instead of gaining true understanding, we're left with this false impression that we understand the judge's reasoning better when in reality we don't really. We just have the assistant the assistant's rationale. And in that case, if we can understand the judge's reasoning, um, the rationale isn't bringing us any closer to it. Okay, so some consequences of the fact that the explainability paradigm generates this sort of ersatz notion of understanding. It's, it's often argued that explainable ML, as I mentioned, supports accountability. But this again is only possible if the explanation provides insight into the actual reasons behind the decision. Um, there is kind of, I mean, there's a little issue I want to flag here as well, but which like I can talk about in Q and A. One might I I don't want to stretch the judge analogy too far. I mean, one might one might wonder how do when can we ever actually, um, you know get the real reasons, so to speak, for why a judge decided the way it did, did, the way they did. I mean, even if a judge tells us their reasons, we know that, you know, we're all fallible at discerning our own intent. So maybe the judges uh, lying to themselves or not really understanding what drove them and ultimately what drives them is not something that's introspectively accessible or that it's accessible to us. So you might think, well, there isn't really much of a difference between the judge and the black box in any case, but the point that I want to focus on is the relative worthlessness of the judge's assistance post hoc rationale, arbitrary post hoc rationale. Um, rec recognizing that, I mean, even in legal context, it may be that we can't get like the real decision, so to speak. Um, so by constructing such, such, said, post hoc rationales for why the black box might have made the prediction it did. Um, even though by, by hypothesis, those are not the actual reasons, we don't come any closer to delineating who is rightfully responsible for a mistake. Instead, explainable ML systems can serve to obfuscate our investigation into a mistake rather than help us understand its source. On, another way to cash out the uh, consequences of the shortcomings of ersatz understanding that's 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 provided by these explainability algorithms um, is sort of in terms of a robustness notion, so to speak. For an explainable algorithm to be trusted, it needs to exhibit some robustness. By this, we mean that the explainability algorithm must generate similar explanations for similar inputs. A doctor using a Machine learning based medical device would naturally question an algorithm that provides very different explanations for two similar patients. But this is not something we can ordinarily guarantee with explainability algorithms. 
uh, often for a very small change in input. For example, in a few in a few pixels of a uh, an image, the approximating explainability algorithm can produce very different and possibly competing explanations. Um, so, for instance, like here's an example of what I mean. So, a black box model's estimated function in this graph in this graphic um, in the plot is represented by uh, by the black curve uh, tracking that blue green boundary, right? So this, this is some non nonlinear uh, nonlinear function um, generated by like a neural net or whatever. The the solid red line would be one local linear approximation um, used to generate explanations for inputs where it's close to the black curve. The dashed red line is another linear approximation in close vicinity used to generate explanations for other inputs nearby. While both are locally faithful in the region where they are approximately tangent to the black curve, the large difference in slope between them means that the explanations can vary quite a bit for similar inputs. But I hope the graphic also illustrates the amount of flexibility that we have in generating such um, such explanations, right? Because the task would be when you have a highly nonlinear function, that you're gonna that you're gonna create some linear approximation to it in some subset of the space. Now, because this one has to be linear, you can't approximate it everywhere. Then, yeah, by hypothesis, they would be the same. And since one is nonlinear, the other would be two. It means that you would sort of pick uh, pick something that's pretty close in as much of the space as you can. But um, even when you do that, you still have quite a lot of flexibility on which particular linear model one uses uh, to provide to the patient or the doctor or the consumer as the actual explanation. Okay. Um, another reason that this could be sort of even more, more misleading, which sort of adds to the problem is that given that people are already susceptible to many well-documented reasoning biases, especially with respect to statistical literacy, the average user of an explainability algorithm is likely not only to fail to understand the black box, but may well be actively mis misled by the linear approximation of how it works. Because still, there's the there's the problem in having to in having to understand the linear model, um, which I kind of put it, put aside at the beginning. But when one is given this as an explanation of the black box and told that this is going to help them sort of understand the why uh, behind the decision, then that can sort of encourage users to interpret parameter coefficients causally, um, or they may find it difficult to reason in, in, in odds ratios when the prediction is uh, binary and so forth. Um, okay. The, so that, that sort of the main, you know, the, the main argument against the explainability paradigm where the explainability paradigm has been illustrated here using this notion of linear approximations. And the argument being that they generate a false sense of understanding, what we've called an ersatz notion of understanding. And that the notion that, that such a notion of understanding doesn't really bring us any closer to satisfying uh, the values that initially motivated uh, the reason for pursuing explainability algorithms, things like understanding the why or transparency or promoting accountability. Um, so in that sense, uh, the sort of the paradigm fails on its own terms um, would be would be the claim. Uh, I want to I want to look at in these last two slides, just one more um, sort of one more paradigm of explanations so that so that the argument doesn't hang entirely on linear ex explanations. And another quite popular paradigm is this notion of counterfactual explanation. And so the counterfactual approach to explainability draws on adversarial perturbations and the idea is as follows. Suppose that a black box model predicts that a person's diabetes risk score on a zero one scale is let's say 0 0.6. This counterfactual explanation then uh, asks the following, what would be a minimal change uh, where minimal is defined in terms of some mathematical measure of distance in the in input space like L1 or L2 distance so that the predicted output is instead 0 0.5. And the minimal change that we construct, we can then present that 
to the patient or the user as the explanation. Well, why, zero why 0 0.5 and why L1 or L2? Both of these are fairly arbitrary. The 0 0.5 part is because the constrained optimization is thereby easier to solve and then we, and we can more easily provide a solution to the problem. And actually a similar thing goes for mathematical distance. We pick some kind of convenient metric like L2 and then use that in constructing, uh, in constructing the counterfactual explanation in terms of a perturbation in the input space. So this counterfactual approach is intended to be analogous to counterfactual explanations in philosophy. For instance, had the glass not been dropped, it would not have broken, is something we might say. Now, in kind of in, 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 in metaphysics in particular, this requires a discussion of modal distance. What would happen in the closest possible world, which is just like ours in all respects, but the glass is not dropped? And in this context, this notion of closeness, uh, a modal notion, is really the core of the analysis and the sub central subject of disagreement. Um, but in the classification literature to identify smaller, smallest changes, it's simply assumed that we would plug in a common suitable mathematical metric. And this assumption basically leaves the counterfactual uh, paradigm subject to the same vulnerabilities that the linear paradigm was subject to. Um, so first, such a choice of metric is, is naturally arbitrary, both due to the flexibility in identifying a distance measure and due to the scale of the features. For example, is a, if we're predicting law school admissions um, or using an algorithmic system to decide who to admit to a law school, is a unit change in LSAT score the same as a unit change in GPA with respect to admission predictions? And how should we scale these relative to each other? Uh, re relatedly, why assume that the counterfactual perturbation must be produced in a way that, say, satisfies the triangle inequality? Second, the explanation is not unique. Um, a patient could learn that the diabetes score would be 0 0.5 if they were 10 pounds lighter, or if they were 5 pounds lighter and their blood pressure were below 120 over 80. Third, it's domain insensitive. Uh, for example, a doctor could usefully tell you that your score would be 0 0.5 if you're 10 pounds lighter, but it would hardly be a value to learn that it would be 0 0.5 if you're 10 years younger. Modal notions of distance could account for this. The possible world where I lose some weight is closer to the actual world than the possible world where I age down. But uh, a counterfactual explanation where the counterfactual is defined in terms of, uh, in terms of a mathematical mathematical uh, notion of distance um, doesn't distinguish between these sort of contextually relevant factors. So a counterfactual explanation shares much the same concerns of post hoc, post -hoc arbitrariness as a linear approximation. Um, again, generating this uh, ersatz notion or understanding, which is ultimately not particularly helpful in satisfying the initial values that motivate uh, the explainability paradigm. Okay, uh, so that's that's that that that's the core of the argument against the explainability paradigm. Um, addressing here, in particular, two sort of very popular and common candidates, namely linear approximations and counterfactual notions. Um, now, in the paper that I incl included as sort of the optional reading, we talk a little bit about what would be more helpful. And much of this is a little bit more narrowly tailored to the context of approving medical devices, because at least some parts of the discussion in that context suggest that explainability, we may want to have explainability as like a requirement of let's say FDA approving a device. And there are point is like, we definitely don't want to require explainability and indeed, there are, there are some things that are better like um, requiring more clinical trials for medical AIML devices, which are typical, which are ordinarily not required. Um, the FDA has traditionally just looked at technical specifications. Um, we can incorporate as much interactivity as possible so as to give people the, or users the ability to sort of play around with a model, which will help them get a sense of how things are changing rather than offering this kind of like mathematical notion of explainability. Or um, 
we simply might want to require interpretability sometimes. And we think there are contexts where interpretability could be required, even if it comes at the cost of sacrificing accuracy. For example, when the decision environment calls for a transparent model um, for reasons of, let's say, distributive justice, if we're having to decide um, sort of uh, how many people will get a kidney donation with limited resources, then maybe you 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 want the model to be um, to be fully transparent. Um, so basically, in cases where there are overarching concern, overarching broader concerns of justice, then ex ante transparency about how the decisions are made can be particularly important. So, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Boris, for, for this very interesting talk. Um, now I would like to open the floor for um, questions. I see that there is already a discussion in the chat if, if you guys want to actually ask those questions out loud. To Boris, I will, uh, whoever raises their hand, I will call your name. Daniel? Hey, so this isn't from the chat, but first of all, um, thanks for the great talk, um, Boris, I really enjoyed it. I guess I had a question just following up on one of the last things that you were saying when you were presenting the slide on what should we do instead. And one of the possibilities was interactivity. And um, you said, you know, that you could potentially as a user interact with this black box algorithm and develop kind of intuitions about how different changes affect it. But to me, this seemed kind of like quite analogous to the example that you pointed out was problematic with the judge where there's the assistant who's looking at the judge's decisions and trying to kind of find patterns based on that. Uh, and as you pointed out, humans are bad at statistical inference. So I feel like the interactivity suggestion seems problematic to me. I see. Um, yeah, I mean, the... The, the, the touted benefit of the interactivity suggestion was that sort of um, it doesn't overpromise in the way that, that the explainability paradigm overpromises. Um, it allows one to evaluate the model a little bit and perhaps increase comfort level with the model, but um, it's not uh, it, it's, it is not it is not presented as helping you understand why the decisions are being made. Um, now, uh, I mean, I see some of the concerns, perhaps the, the, the user might then draw the wrong conclusions by, by, by playing around with the model. And that, that's certainly worth, worth keeping in mind. I mean, in, in that sense, uh, you know, there's, from, from that perspective of kind of like limits to statistical literacy that I mentioned, that, that can kind of be a concern for any kind of model, including even just using a transparent model, people can misunderstand it. Um, but basically just the, the, the response would be that interactivity, interactivity um, can be helpful in the way that models which are just transparent can be helpful. But that's not to say that that, that can't be, you know, misunderstood by users as well. Ronald is next. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my concern is that I believe the issue of AI explainability is very important. And by interpreting it in terms of one particular um, inadequate way to solve it doesn't seem to me uh, appropriate. Um, let me give you, and the only the only good uh, approach that I've seen in the literature, and I'm not an expert, so this may not be totally correct, but there's a group at IBM that has formulated AI explainability in terms of questions. Let me give you a few examples in my own words. Um, why did you make that decision? What was the rationale? What were the critical issues and salient factors in making that decision? How certain were you that the decision was correct? Or in terms of some real applications, 
what have I not done in my five years in jail that caused me to be denied parole? Why do you think I might be a criminal? What caused the self-driving car to crash? Why did you destroy my village? And it seems to me the uh, uh, people interested in uh, explainable AI, interpretable AI, there are lots of terms, need to be redoubling their effort in order to be able to ensure that AI algorithms, including deep learning algorithms, are able to answer these questions, both because legally in Europe, they're going to be encouraged or forced to do so, but just on ethical grounds. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess in short, the point here is that the argument is by no means intended to undermine the value of transparency in, in algorithmic models, um, but rather to argue to undermine uh, a particular way that transparency has been construed, which is in terms of this explainability paradigm. Now, um, I understand that, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, there's no monopoly in the terminology here, and we definitely don't want the argument to hang on the terminology. So if one says, well, I, you know, I, I really prefer to use explainability to refer to something broader, that's fine. Then our, our argument really applies to some of these um, basically influential prevailing approaches that have been construed as explainability ones, particularly linear approximations and counterfactual approximations. And the main argument against those is that while we, while we appreciate the value of, of answering all of the whys that you gave in your questions, these canonical approaches are not faithfully answering those whys in a way that we would want from the perspective of why we care about that question. Like, what could I have done differently to get, uh, to get parole rather than being denied it? All right, I see Jack. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a, a little confused on I think what might be a straightforward point, which is um, it seemed like your argument, though the examples were obviously drawn from machine learning stuff is is a fairly general argument against um, explainability of decision making in general. Um, and so my, my question is, like, what can you give an example of explaining a human decision that would satisfy um, what you want of explainability? Like in the judge case, where the clerk goes and looks at the files afterwards and finds the pattern, um, that that might be a good explanation of the judge's decision if the judge, you know, looked at the files and maybe didn't articulate that that pattern was the basis of their decision, but it might have been, um, and like that's not good. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got when it comes to explaining things like judicial decisions. Um, so I, I just, uh, I didn't understand, maybe you were, yeah, that's sure. my question. I guess there's like a, a, a quick answer and then a longer answer. And the quick answer would be that in ordinary human decision-making, the, the post hoc approximation is not, uh, is not misleading in the way that it is in the algorithmic context. So if the clerk says, uh, here's a couple ways that the decision could have been made. I don't really know why the judge decided, but um, this would kind of fit the pattern. Uh, one wouldn't be, one would not be misled into thinking that that is why the judge decided the way that she decided. It would be quite clear that this is a post hoc rationale being used to justify the decision. In the explainability paradigm, um, it's actually providing quite a bit of confusion to people by giving them a, by giving them a post hoc approximation and calling that an explanation of the decision and then pointing to these features and saying, here's why your blood pressure uh, 
uh, sorry, here's why your diabetes risk score is what it is. It's because of this feature plus this feature plus this feature in a kind of additive linear way. Um, and that, that answers your you know, question as to why your risk is what it is. Um, and when, when couched in this way, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is in, intended to mislead. Or, well, not intended, maybe unintentionally, but it certainly doesn't mislead. Um, now, the longer answer was just like, well, there might be a deeper question about how do we ever know what the quote unquote actual reasons behind the judge's decision are if there is such a thing. I mean, they write opinions, but are those opinions masquerading something else? And like, oh, okay, fair enough. But that I would wanna sort of flag a little bit and focus on the fact that um, in the legal analog, the judge's assistant versus the judge's rationale um, is much less likely to be misleading than it is in the algorithmic case. Was that the was that the short and the long answer? That was both the both. The I, I didn't I didn't well I mean I is, didn't is elaborate it, the longer answer because it take it it, it, it then leads us into a discussion of sort of um, does anyone ever have introspective access to the actual reasons of their decision, whatever those are? Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, we need to go there because if we agree that no one does. But uh, so does that mean you're just saying that the there's a problem when people uh, put too much stock in the kind of explanation that's possible of this kind of model. Like it might, it, there might be some value in it, um, but it's it. But people, ex, when they're talking about it, they oversell it. And and you're, uh, I mean, you're just yeah. I mean that's a that's a good way of putting it. For example, in a kind of research and development context, if one finds it helpful to generate different approximations to, uh, to a model as a way of exploring certain hypotheses for, um, you know, for like, uh, let's say, you know, biological or whatever relationships and whatever the underlying field is, um, then, then sure, um, you know, you can, you can use it in that context. But, uh, but yeah, they overpromise and fail to deliver in the sense of sort of, promoting these legal and democratic ideals that motivate the research to begin with. Jack, do you want to answer again or? Right, I don't want to keep uh, jumping the queue. Uh, so I'll leave off, but just to register, uh, the reason I'm still skeptical of that answer still is that I think those democratic ideals and so on are also not necessarily well served by judicial decision writing, but it's the best we've got, right? That, but oh, okay, I did what I just said I wouldn't do. Um, so sorry. But yeah, thanks. yeah, fair, fair. I mean, but but look, there's no point. There, there's no need for us to assume that the human decision making legal system is perfect in order to make this argument. It's just to say that you know that 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 might not be ideal, but if if you already know that that's not helpful, then doing recreating it in this context isn't going to be any better. Um, so you know, it's like here we have some misleading explanations. Let's now, in the algorithmic context, also generate some misleading explanations, right? All right. So now we have Daniel, and then Lauren, and then Jennifer. Um, so I guess maybe just stepping back for a second and moving away from like the legal side of things and human decision making. But I mean, I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding like what the issue is with like the white box, white box, black, black box and, and this explainability. It seems like maybe um, my interpretation is that it's about saying that they're the same. And because I feel like there's situations in which both models, like there's the quote, like all models are wrong, but some are useful. I mean, I can think of a situation where you would want both models, you would want like, a black box, black box model that had higher predictability. Say there's, you're trying to predict a fire in a school, a children's school. You want the best possible model that can predict the fire that you can, because it's very important, you know? Um, so if it's a black box model, great, you use that. But at the same time, you maybe want to be able to reduce the incidence of fires and the black box model isn't gonna help you do that. So you need another model that actually has some kind of like human interpretable components that you can manipulate and that you can kind of like do experimentation with potentially or at least observation. 
So I think that, um, so my question is, is, am I interpreting your um, dissatisfaction with the white box, black box kind of interpretability, interpretability question correctly? And do you agree that there are situations in which you want both models and just that we don't say that they're the same? Um, I, 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 think, I think you are interpreting it correctly. And uh, I, don't, I don't disagree that there can be situations where, uh, where we may wish to have both types. Um, the, I mean, here's sort of like the dialectic, right? Uh, there's been a lot of arguments in favor of having explainability as a requirement, for example, approving a medical device, um, because without this notion of explainability, um, you know, we're not going to have uh, transparency in the associated values that come with that. And our argument basically says that's not really a great idea. You don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to require explainability because there can be uh, first, it may not bring all of these promised ideals. And second, there are other alternative ways uh, to relieve some of the worries that people have with, um, with opaque decision-making systems. But your example is one where you say like, well, in this kind of like social engineering context or this, this design context, like, you know, like preventing fires and creating a policy for mitigating them, we've found that as we're sort of working through this, it's helpful for us to generate explanations to get a better idea um, of what kind of interventions to make. I don't think our, uh, I wouldn't want our argument to go so far to then say, uh, you know, no, you're, you're not allowed. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, if, if that proves to be uh, useful in practice and thinking about the kinds of interventions at this kind of design stage, uh, then fine. It's more like we, we uh, were not convinced that there is an argument for having this as a requirement, for example, in the approval process of some kind of device. Great, Laura's next. Okay, great, thanks very much. I really enjoyed your talk and I like how you're pushing back on explainability. Uh, you know, I work in the health context and I think the term explainability is, is actually carries a lot of risk. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. Um, so, you know, it's, I think transparency is what we need to push for, uh, transparency and reproducibility actually. But um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to some of the harms with trying to interpret in this context. So in, in the health context, if you take a complex algorithm and you pick a variable and try to interpret it causally, and then your next step is, well, then maybe we should intervene on that biomarker that came up because that was the one that had the biggest Shapley coefficient in our model or whatever you're going to use to say that it's um, and then you could potentially actually cause harm because that's actually not an appropriate uh, causal interpretation. So I wonder if you could actually speak a little bit to the harms um, and um, maybe the harms is what the regulators actually need to start thinking about uh, versus the, you know, we need explainable AI to have to regulate these medical devices or technologies and actually flip it around and say, don't interpret it as causally, or you actually have the potential to cause harm. So I just wondered your perspective on that. Um, well, yeah, great, great, thank you. This is sort of like a nice follow-up to Daniel's question in a sense. Um, I mean, so I, you know, I, in, 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 in response to Daniel, I sort of mentioned, well, look, if, if, you, if you find it beneficial, then, um, it's not like our argument is uh, intended as as suggesting that you should never use these models. And you you provide a nice contrast by pointing out that, but you know, by exploring these kinds of um, after the fact explanations, it can also be harmful because then you can misread these variables in a causal way and intervene on them in a way that then proves to be harmful to the patient. Um, so yeah, it could be beneficial, but it could just as well be harmful on the on the other end. Um, well, but the, the lesson we take from that is, again, that sort of explainability isn't the be all end all and that you shouldn't certainly wouldn't want that as a requirement, especially when it comes to approving medical devices. So what would you want? 
um, well, you would want some kind of um, more involved approval process that goes beyond the technical specifications of a system. Like here's the specificity, here's the sensitivity, and here's the like after the fact approximation. But you might want to look at how are doctors engaging with the system, how are patients engaging with the system, what kinds of harms might arise, and and you might also want to do this in a sort of um, more continuous way, um, where the the regulator and 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 the manufacturer have more of a sort of partnership of necessity rather than a one-off review, which was the case, for instance, when it comes to traditional software. It's like you submit the software, everything is reviewed, and then it's approved, and then it's done. Whereas in the context of these kind of systems, you might have more of an ongoing monitoring approach. So that's, I don't know, that's, that's sort of some thoughts here, but um, Great. I'd Thank like you. to point. Thank you. Jennifer's next. Hey Boris, thanks so much for the talk. That was really interesting. I feel like um, I, I feel like I slightly want to respond to something Jack said and just see if you're on board with me. So Jack was suggesting, you know, in the human case also, um, there's not really any such thing as the explainable decision making. You know, we don't have perfect introspective insight into you know the grounds of any human decision. And and I, I just feel like you we might want to stress that actually for some human decision making. Um, are, for example, uh, engaging in conscious reasoning, which could be communicated to another person, um, which could have, you know, the kind of logical and communicable structure that um, that actually does make what we're doing more explicable than um, the kinds of decisions that are being made by your black boxes. And I just wanted to check that you were, you're, 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 on, you're on board with that as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just fine with that. Uh, yeah. Right, I, I mean, that would make, make more sense of why it is legitimate to have these sort of very high standards of uh, accountability um, that start motivating people to demand uh, explainability of, uh, of black box programs of a type that then won't be um, so much on offer because of the characteristics of the decision-making that are getting made by those programs, which are not, um, of a computational type that our conscious reasoning is good at executing. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it's possible instead of thinking of explainability as always having to be just motivated by the sort of super high ideals of accountability and so on, could you have explainability that's um, sort of motivated by much um, lower ideal? Like you just recognize people have some kind of need for uh, narrative uh, explanation of some type in order to feel comfortable with trusting a, um, you know, say a, a medical uh, um, algorithm that, that that's supposed to be assisting them. I'm wondering if specifically, could you have like transparent explainability where you were sort of clear with people, this is not actually a model of the real workings of the black box. This is just an approximation which might help you to um, feel comfortable with it because it's going to be explaining what's going on in terms. Like, I wonder if there's any way of just being yeah. um, being open well, about what it is well, yeah. that the that the algorithm is trying to capture. That's that, that's a great point and suggestion. Like, for instance, part of the part part of the kind of vice that we take that comes in the explainability paradigm paradigm is the fact that your uh, you're explicitly fitting the black box prediction, but you don't have to do that, right? You could, for example, just actually use a black box model, which you found to be somewhat more accurate, and also use a simple transparent model, not to fit the black box predictions, but to make its own prediction. And so you could tell the patient, um, your diabetes risk is 0 0.6 using this model that is our kind of leading state of the art model, and it turns out it's 0 0.57 um, if we were to use this simple model, which relies on your um, age and uh, genetic history and whatever, whatever. And these are the weights we give to that. And in yeah, that, that would case, be, yeah, that would be really great. Yeah. yeah um, so that, that would be great. Um, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be over promising in the way that the explainability paradigm promises to kind of give you the why it would just be telling you like, yeah, in that case, the, the, the transparent model, I mean, that, that is the why, that's, that's, the, that's the actual rationale for the revised prediction, and you can work with both. Yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Thank you. Lisa? 
Hey, hi, thank you. This was our super interesting um, talk. I had a couple uh, questions um, somewhat related to some of the things that, that Jennifer just raised. Um, and I think that part of what's been sort of uh, niggling at me in the, the discussion, um, there's lots of these judicial examples coming up. So I'm a law professor. So of course, my, I perk up on those. And it seems to me that the, the demands of whatever we might want to call explainability in that in the sort of legal context are going to be quite different from, you know, even licensing a medical device or gaining public trust in the use of a medical device. So I'm kind of uneasy about saying that, you know, explainability is kind of this one thing we need to give these causal explanations of the why. Um, and, uh, and then we can use that in these particular different contexts. And then you're saying, well, we can't actually get there. Um, it seems to me that what the demands of explainability are in different contexts are actually quite different. And the, the, just to go back to judicial analogies, because um, they seem to always come up in these kinds of questions. Um, so my perspective on, on kind of the, the, the judge, not so much the assistant um, uh, that you gave in your example, but the judge um, herself and her decision making, it's very true. Human decision makers don't understand their own basis for decisions. And you know we can't give a causal explanation of the internal workings of that decision. But in the legal system, we don't need to um, because it is a more kind of public reasoning process, similar to what Jennifer said, but with some additional kind of components that I would put out there, which is it's a system of public reasoning. So it's not just that you're engaged in reasoning, but that there are certain kind of public norms that the judge is engaging with. And the explanation is not a causal explanation. It's a justification. It's a justification for the decision and which could be very acceptably a post hoc kind of decision uh, explanation. Um, because it's saying this decision is justified according to the applicable legal norms. It's also public in the sense it's made public and there's a whole process there. It's not a one off. Um, it's given to a whole public system where other people can interact with that reasoning and challenge it. And it's not a one off decision because there's layers of um, a kind of an accountability system where that reasoning itself can be challenged. And so the idea that this is the, the you keep talking in this discussion about the, the legal and connecting it to this you know, need for a causal explanation. I don't think that the, those analogies hold. Um, and even in one of the other examples you're given about the agent, sometimes we want to know what the agent's um, intent was and uh, in assigning responsibility. But there's all sorts of models of responsibility that don't require that at all, including just basic negligence. Um, so I think there's lots of contexts where we don't need anything that looks like this causal model of explanation. So by saying we can't have a causal model of explanation, it doesn't answer the question of why we still might want something else. Um, so, oh, that, th thank you. This is th this is all very helpful. And actually, I mean, the way that you the way that you frame the rationale is given in the legal context um, as sort of justifications, which are uh, motivated by sort of like the needs of the of, of the legal system on the of, or the particular context that kind of points to sort of Jennifer's proposed suggestion as the more appropriate thing to do in this context rather than to rather than to fixate on explanations in particular right like you want one could say what really matters here isn't understanding the why uh, because you know for the for the reasons we've given here you're not actually going to understand the why you're not actually going to get a causal explanation but um, what we want is kind of like uh, some kind of justifiability around the decision and one way to provide justifiability around the decision is uh, you should use a black box model in tandem with an interpretable one and you know you should always provide sort of like both or multiple or multiple um, outputs to the to the patient or whoever it is uh, so that they can see sort of like uh, multiple pathways leading to the decision and this would provide uh, this would provide sort of, some of what's needed in giving a justification for the decision, but it wouldn't claim to be uh, providing like a why behind the black box prediction. Um, and that would be fine. So yeah, I mean, I sort of, I, I take your point as like kind of helpfully reframing some of our argument is to say that in these legal contexts, sometimes, I mean, uh, we don't, 
we're not always fixated on the why just because we need a causal explanation. What we want is some kind of justification of the decision and there are certain processes in place and norms and so forth that, um, that dictate what a, what a reasonable and a plausible justification is and you know how judges present opinions and so forth. And in this context, we could also focus on what's a plausible justification and what makes one more effective than another rather than fixating on are we answering the why or are we not and and that's great we have sheila now hi boris i i'm afraid i'm going to say many things that people have already said so let me echo some things that that uh lisa and jennifer and others have said first thank you for the interesting talk i think um it's a message, you know, this message of the limitations of explainability in especially in deep learning models is, is one that I think a lot of people recognize, but that's not getting out there. And I think the, the, the notion or the aspiration that explainability and interpretability is going to, to be achievable is, is you know, also um, something that may not not is, an, is a good aspiration, but it's but it's hard to to realize. And, and I guess one of the observations that I think we've we've heard here is that perhaps what we're doing is holding our you know we're holding our AI to a higher standard and and then we hold human beings that that human beings are doing a lot of these these tasks right now but but um, and and can't provide suitable explanations rather than post hoc rationalizations for why they make decisions or why they they do things and that that it's because it's hard it's hard to reflect consciously on. On, on our decision making. And I guess I wanted to point out that, that um, a lot of where deep learning has made big advances is in perceptual capabilities. So, so things that, that for where the building blocks themselves are not interpretable. So even to try to combine them together or to create a linear approximation of them, if those individual building blocks are you know, an infrared sensor or a combination of an infrared sensor and a vision system and a haptic system, then there's no way you're going to be able to explain it again. Like I can't explain why I recognize Jennifer and, and Jillian in, in their little checker boxes, but I do. And I can say with, with great authority that, you know, that is Jennifer, I heard her voice, I see her, um, but I can't explain to you or break it apart to explain why, why why it is that I know that that's Jennifer, or why I recognize her voice. Sorry to pick on you, Jennifer. Um, you're in you're in the middle. Um, but and and so it's it's and it's similarly hard for a, a deep learning system to do that as well. So I think this notion that that and no one would ask me to do that, and they would trust me that if I said I saw Jennifer, that it really was Jennifer. And and so maybe part of this, I think, to Lisa's point and to Jennifer's point and to some of the other things we've been hearing, is that the part of this is about how we build systems that, that we can trust. And, and, and so maybe for some of these systems, trying to do explanation uh, is not the right way to do it or try to, trying to, do, to deliver explanations as some sort of a linguistic explanation may not be the right way to provide, to build that trust and to provide um, um, some sort of uh, rationalization or justification to the user. Maybe if I showed you a hundred pictures of Jennifer that, that were verified as being labeled, you would all believe that that, you know, this image that you're seeing is really of Jennifer. Maybe that's another way for me to justify that, that, that that's Jennifer that I see. Or maybe, you know, I have, as with doctors, um, maybe the system has to, um, you know, be, be certified in some way to have done, to have gone through, you know, a million, um, a, a million test scenarios where it achieved some some level of standard so that, that the average person would trust it. And that's what we do with a, a number of our safety critical systems now. We have the same sorts of problems. So maybe, you know, super interesting and provocative um, message that you've you've been you've been um, sharing with us today. And 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 I think some of the reactions too are maybe about thinking about what the right problem to solve is and what problems are solvable and what we can really expect our AIs to do so that we, we really have, we can trust our systems um, and benefit from, from the many things that, that, that those AI systems can do that, that we can't do, including using perceptual capabilities that we don't have, such as infrared. I mean, infrared is a great example for driving. Um, that we don't have infrared capability. So even to be able to explain it is, is, is hard in, in some context. So anyways, that was, I don't know whether you have any, I've yeah, been talking no. a lot, I mean, maybe that's a statement rather than a question. I'm interested in your, your, your thoughts. 
Well, it, 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 it's a great and tremendously helpful statement. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, in, in, in general, I, I, I agree with all of this. And I would just summarize your point as being that, yeah, um, explainability isn't the be all end all with respect to trust. And I think you're absolutely right. And we, we, we mentioned this elsewhere a little bit like by analogy, for instance, when it comes to like, uh, um, you know, the regulatory approval like FDA or whatever regulatory body of prescription drugs. I mean, typically, why do people trust that, you know, when you're prescribed a certain antibiotic that, you know, you can take this and it's safe and it'll be effective and so forth. It's not that you're like, hey, explain to me the, you know, biological pathway by it works. I want to understand everything. It's more like the trust comes from the fact that, um, the expectation is that the drug has gone through a certain process and that the process was designed in a way that it would um, it would pay attention to the potential harms and evaluate them properly against the benefits and so forth. And once it's gone through that process, you're like, okay, I can trust this drug. That doesn't necessarily mean I understand um, you know, the biological mechanisms by which it works. Great, thank you. Do we have any final questions? We have a few more minutes. Jillian? Yeah, um, and, and Boris, I'm so sorry I missed your presentation. I had a, another conference I needed to participate no in before this. So, but as you know, I've been thinking about a lot of these issues around justification and explainability, and I'm really looking forward to more conversation. So, so I, I, I kind of want to ask a couple of questions which you may very well have addressed uh, in your talk. Um, um, but, you know, just, just thinking about, I mean, the, the point that there's a, there's a functionality we're interested in. So when Lisa talks about this concept of justification, which uh, I've also been working on, uh, you know, it, it's a functionality associated with providing justifications. That's what provides for the stability of our human systems. And I don't think it's just legal. It, it's actually, that's, we provide reasons and accountability, and as Lisa's pointing out, sort of with a with a with a a, a a regulatory structure around it in the sense of that's a good reason, that's not a good reason, right? That that's a hypocritical reason. We're actually gonna, you know, we have norms, but what kinds of reasons and the publicness of reason is is the in some ways those shared rules about uh, what are acceptable or appropriate reasons and not. Um, if what we're trying to do is so when Sheila gives the example of you know, recognizing Jennifer's picture and the confidence there, right? An explanation there might be, how do we trust that that's a, a good prediction about the, about the world? And in fact, we do need different information to, and tests to confirm that a, a machine learning system is accurately identifying pictures because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside them that we don't know about, right? Like why does the, the automatic, the self-driving car not recognize the person with the bicycle and the, and the grocery bags because, oh, you know, like a human would have not made that mistake uh, who, who was able to recognize objects. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, and, and again, apologies if, if you address this, but you know, the different, the different purposes to which we uh, are putting like the provision of explanations and we want very different things for very different purposes. If I'm designing the system and I want to confirm accuracy I want to confirm reliability and predictive um, uh, confidence. I, I, I want to know different things and have different explanations than if I'm trying to make sure that the doctor is, is you know, taking due care in, in choosing, or the hospital is taking due care in choosing, um, choosing a treatment. Just, I, I, maybe, maybe you addressed all this about sort of the different, like many different purposes for explanations and accounting. I mean, I, I generally like this picture that's emerged of focusing on the relevant norms of justification, which are going to be context sensitive. And um, I take it to be a sort of complementary to the argument here, because if we look at the sort of if we if we look at these context sensitive norms, we're often not we're often going to find that um, there isn't much value in doing the kind of explainability in the in the paradigms that I've highlighted. So if the context is like uh, disease prediction, um, then a kind of thing that could be helpful would be like something that um, I mentioned in the conversation with Jennifer, which was like, well, you could just use 
you could, for example, want um, parallel models so that you use uh, an interpretable model and the black box so as to provide more transparency, for lack of a better word, now um, so that people uh, can have multiple predictions to work with. Meanwhile, in the kind of example that um, that Sheila gave, where we're doing like um, image recognition, well, doing a using a transparent model isn't going to help much. It's like we fit a linear model to all these pixel values or something. And now it's no longer as helpful in this context as providing any kind of um, further like justification for accepting or trusting the system. It's just like, now it's gonna be a clunky useless prediction in addition to a different one. Um, so to motivate, to, you know, to, 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 to endorse trust, in a, in a context that's involving something like image recognition or something, well, there you might, what well, you might want to focus on rather than offering an additional prediction is maybe like, um, like I mentioned by analogy to the prescri pres prescription drugs example, you might want to focus on the regulatory or approval pathways that led to the system being used and what they were so that they can help um, promote trust. But overall, the idea being that if you focus on these kind of like justificatory norms by context, you will rarely find that, um, you know, uh, explainability is something worth requiring, basically. Great, thank you very much. Cool. We have one more question from Rhonda. I hate being the last question. Boris, thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation today. So as I've been listening and then listening to the comments, one thing that early up when you were talking about um, sort of the black box, immediately that metaphor of a black box means it's not transparent, right? Like straight up, that's literally why it's called a black box. But as we go ahead and we talk, we keep coming back to these words. So there's trust, and then we talk about explainability and causality, and we keep I think actually there's a there's a major um, incompatibility with using the word transparency and and when I keep coming back to it I'm like transparent to whom like so in your example with the doctors right the doctor wants to make sure that the patients you know he, that they have some some understandability or, or credibility in what this the algorithm is going to produce and some transparency is required to get that trust on board. But that's never in that same scenario, the patients don't really expect much transparency per se in that interaction with their doctor on the same on the issue of the same result. So I, I do I wonder if we can even use transparent at all. Like I'm starting to think in this case, maybe that's not a thing we're after. I, and I know we're used to trying to say, I think what we mean is access to some kind of background context or something, but I don't know that these black boxes can also be transparent. So I just wanted to, to leave, leave you to comment on that. I th thank you. So sort of the way the way I construed your suggestion here as is as sort of like putting some pressure on the binary distinction between the transparent and the black box. And what your comment really suggests is like, well, look, there's kind of like a fluid spectrum here. I mean, transparent to a, a patient, transparent to a doctor, or transparent to the system designer, and those could all require different kinds of models. Um, and and basically, I'm I am like all in favor of that graded view of transparency. So I mean, it, it's really this sort of explainability paradigm that that starts kind of simplistically with this idea of uh, look, we're using these black boxes. That's a problem. Let's generate an explanation. Problem solved. Whereas your suggestion would point to something like, well, depending on context what counts as a sufficiently transparent model is gonna be different. And then you're gonna to have to answer like, you know, how much of that can you provide? Sometimes, I mean, again, like sometimes a simple linear model with just a few parameters, that's not gonna be transparent to, to, to a patient who doesn't understand like basic like regression ideas. Um, sometimes a decision, you know, a, a simple decision tree will be helpful. Other times, you know, something, something more complicated is just fine. Um, so, but it's, it's to say I'm sort of I'm all, I'm all in favor of the graded view. And from that perspective, it will again rarely be the case that having explainability as some kind of blanket requirement solves our problems. It would actually require carefully thinking about what's, what's required under each context. And in that sense, that's kind of um, also relevant to uh, Jillian and, and, and Sheila and Jennifer's comments. 
All right. So I think if, unless we have any final questions, um, I just want to thank. Make, let me, yeah. sorry, Beatriz, I'm just gonna make one last, one last observation here. Um, so there's an, there, this, this conversation kind of reminds me of um, something we see in, in law and contracts a lot. We're seeing it a lot even more today. Like, fr frankly, this fantasy that if you give people more information, they will get, they will make better decisions. So we had a whole movement in consumer protection that said the way to solve our consumer protection problems is give people lots of disclosures, put lots of notices out there and let them make informed consent, which, you know, we live in a really complex world. Most people can't even process it. Like, you know, we all see the sign when you walk onto the airplane or, you know, the disclosures, we, we get with everything. They don't, they, don't, they don't really work very well for us because that's not a very good model of the way humans make decisions in a complex environment. And I sort of think that the, and, and now the, you know, the click boxes that were, you know, well, you've read all that stuff, you've made a choice. Um, and I, I wonder if um, uh, the, you know, the, the this, this idea that explainability is what we should be aiming for is built on the same false idea that, well, you know, if you'd explained everybody, then, that, then what? They could make a better choice. They could decide whether to engage with that hospital or buy that product. I just don't think it's a very good model at all of the way humans make, you know, have to make decisions in a complex. I just want to make sure it's a safe product or it's competent medical care. And I, frankly, it's not about the explanation. It's, it's, it's about the, the system that is ascertaining and, and providing reliability. There are contexts where I think we need explanations and there are contexts where clearly we need justifications. I should be able to say, I want you to prove to me that your, your decision to treat me in this way was not because of my race or my gender or my postal code or, um, or that you were paying careful attention, right? You didn't flip a coin back in the doctor's room to decide which treatment to use. Um, those are the, the, anyway, I think the, I think we're barking, barking up the explainability tree is like, well, it's just built on not a very good model the way we all have to make choices in a very complex world. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, I mean, much of our motivation, um, motivation in arguing against the notion of explainability is to push back against this notion, as you put it, that like more information is better or at a minimum more information is harmless. And so the thought then is like, well, what's wrong with, you know, wh why not have this as a requirement? Because surely like having the explanation can't be all that bad as compared to not having it. Um, but, uh, you know, um, as, as we sort of discussed, it, it, it can be harmful and counterproductive and, and like useless at best, in which case there we don't see why one would want to uh, re 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 require this. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say, I have definitely not caught up on all of the chat discussion, um, but I do see that one of my co-authors, Teos, uh, has been in the talk and contributing to the chat. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume some of this has been addressed in the, in the chat. Um, All right, uh, great. Thank you so much, Boris, for your wonderful presentation. Um, really appreciate your time um, to come and speak with us. Uh, please remember to join us next week uh, for a talk by our very own Associate Director and Research Lead, Lisa Austin, on why we should regulate information about persons rather than personally identifiable information. So I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Thank you again, Boris. Thank you all.